<laughs> in addition to his public transport uh, work, his previous research uh, spanned experimental use of CubeSat, uh, satellites, uh, recycling composites, carbon fibre crash structures, and he's also a volunteer at the South London Makerspace. Can you please put your hands together for Ed Bilson. Thank you. Thank you. And just to clear up a, a slight error at the beginning, I don't have any scientific credentials. Um, so, <laughs> right, so judges, presenters, uh, esteemed guests, I'm here today to discuss a 21st century problem with a 19th century solution. <laughs> the benefits of public transport are very well established. It reduces pollution, it shapes cities, and it improves access to education and jobs. It also entertains small children. <laughs> and gives transport engineers something to talk about at parties. <laughs> However, it faces two serious problems. Take London. Despite the best public transport network in the world, capacity is only just keeping ahead of demand. This shortfall results in difficulty commuting, service delays, and exacerbates our second major issue. <laughs> a serious decline in public toilet provision. <laughs> now, transport and sanitation have always gone hand in hand. You've got Roman roads and public toilets, Victorian railways and battle jet sewers, and of course, British the Rail and this cat, Tiddles, who lived in the public toilets at Paddington Station. <laughs> Unfortunately, Tiddles died in 1983, and it's all been downhill since then, <laughs> with poor hygiene scores at even the best public toilets and a general decline in numbers. There's only one solution. We need a rapid, high-frequency commuter service which delivers a new generation of public toilets. We need to fire commuters <laughs> through the sewers on a torrent of high-pressure sewage. Now, it, it is difficult to see why this idea hasn't been implemented before. Uh, this is an underground railway tunnel. Note the similarity of shape with this, the Fleet Storm Relief Sewer. And this sewer runs directly from major commuter stations around King's Cross to London's financial hub in the city. Our proposal includes new, high-quality public toilets at King's Cross, combined with a transport hub in the existing sewer. Passengers can board spacious, comfortable, and most importantly, airtight pods, <laughs> which will then travel down the sewer at 50 miles an hour. A departure every three quarters of a second, a journey time of two minutes, 128,000 commuters every morning powered by the natural hydraulic pressure of sewage. Now, I know what you're thinking. Can it be done? By which, naturally, you mean, is there enough sewage? Well... <laughs> Asking each passenger to spend a penny delivers about 1% uh, of our requirement. We can make use of other local sources, such as the 5 million kilos a day which goes into the Thames, but it's clear we need to think bigger. The area inside the M25 <laughs> delivers 186,000 tonnes, and by adding in South East England, Essex, Sussex and Norfolk, we actually <laughs> exceed demand by 3% for a total of 416,000 tonnes per hour. That's 118 swimming pools a day. So, yes, there's just enough sewage. And imagine the uplift in public mood if a fifth of the nation knew they were helping us commute just by sitting on the toilet. <laughs> the, uh, the hydraulic pressure will come from a tower at King's Cross. Uh, this is quite a simple calculation uh, because we can neglect friction between the pods and the sewer wall thanks to London's endemic fatberg problem. <laughs> We, uh, we only need 143 metres of head for this to work, and as King's Cross is currently being redeveloped, one more tower probably won't excite comment. <laughs> now, 140 metres sounds like a lot, but in London it's quite modest, just a bit taller than the London Eye. <laughs> uh, not including the 300 million litre sewer tank on the top. <laughs> Now, naturally, it's not as simple as all that. There are certainly engineering challenges we will need to overcome. Uh, the return journey in the evenings will require a second tower in the city, uh, which we'll need to build or rent. Uh, we need somewhere to store 15,000 transport pods. Uh, and focus groups have noted concerns about the smell. 
but I invite you to contemplate what might be achieved. 265 meters gets us three hours of operation. 950 meters <laughs> gets us the tallest building in the world by quite some margin and round the clock service. <laughs> that is a public transport system we can be proud of. Thank you for your attention. And, uh, and I'll, I'll be happy to give grovelling, obsequious answers to any questions the panel has. OK, yes, I have questions. <laughs> uh, oh, no. Two, two in fact. Um, so my first question is, is how are the stations going to work if your frequency is going to be every three quarters of a second? Um, and the second is, is how are you going to, at the stations, you're saying the pods were airtight, but during, in the stations themselves, how are you going to keep the passengers and let's say, the track <laughs> separate from, from each other? Um, well, the, I think I'll, I'll address the latter one first. Um, the way you do this is by having a multi-platform station, uh, and we will need about 80 platforms. <laughs> um, but, you know, each pod will get guided into its platform. People can get out. There's a, there's a certain dwell time, the same as there is with any public transport network. Uh, that, that's definitely manageable. Uh, the first question um, regarding, uh, you know, how you actually uh, slow stuff down when the, the lead times are so short. Um, have you ever been on a log flume? <laughs> pretty, pretty much that. Big, big pool of sewage. You know, some guys there with poles kind of pushing... <laughs> Pushing, pushing the pods in the right direction. This is all, this is all very much achievable technology. Yeah, happy, thank you. Great. <laughs> um, Seems that tight. <laughs> Given the number of people we're talking about and the speed at which they'll be moving, how do you plan on handling blockages? So, I, th I think the, the way you address this is uh, by considering the, the tube itself. Firstly, uh, we already have a blockage problem in London uh, because of all the fatbergs, as yes, I mentioned. Yes, but there's not people moving through it. So, are you, so is, is your question uh, what happens if, if one of the pods gets stuck? Yes, essentially. Right, so um, the, I think the lubrication helps with that. And the other part, the other part of that is um, the other major component in fatbergs is actually wet wipes. So we keep the inside of the sewers very clean because we've got these pods going through very, very quickly. And I think statistically the number of... Uh, the, the chance of blockages is relatively low. That said, um, the first uh, action I, I would take, you know, if I have approval for this kind of thing, um, is to actually build a full-size demonstrator. Um, so it's, it's, you know, I'm very much a kind of big ideas, concept, engineer. Um, I'm not going to get into the detail just, just yet. <laughs> Par Thank partly because the thought horrifies me. <laughs> so I wouldn't mind following up with a little detail, even though you don't like details. Um, and that was one of the first statements that you made, that you said that engineers are interesting. Who told you that? <laughs> Al allow me to grovel slightly. Um, it, if, I, if I may offer a very small correction. Uh, public transport gives engineers something interesting to talk about at parties. And, and so our, our, our default state is that we're very, very uninteresting people. I'm not convinced, but... <laughs> um, have you taken into account the fact that... Um, I, think it's, I think it's a fact that people tend to have one poo a day. And therefore, the return journey may not have as much force behind it. <laughs> So, uh, that, that, that's a very uh, astute observation. Um, th this, the, the volume in my calculations was based uh, chiefly on uh, the number of flushes per day per person. Uh, and the great thing is, once it gets into the sewers, you can basically just assume like a uniform density. Uh, and there is, there is information out there about, you know, how dense sewage is, uh, what the effect of different temperatures is on the viscosity and that kind of thing. We have, we have tried where possible to take that into account, yeah. Well, that's answered all of that. Um, <laughs> Ed Bilson, everyone. Thank you.